for restoration. And that was formalized in 92. Just do a couple bullets, just back up, because I mean, this is 17 years, so I mean, periodically we come in and talk about it. But, but let's back up and remember what we said in the beginning was the deal. And then where we are 17 late years later, did it hold up? So first, in 1992, it appeared to us Tobo were in big trouble in the Sayusla. The returns were about four or 5,000 fish. Historically, they sustained canneries in 1900 of 70,000 fish a year for over 25 years of harvest. So the fish were at one or two percent of their historic abundance. That we knew. The second piece is in snorkeling early in the 80s, I noticed in years when there were very few coho juveniles, they were big. And in years when there were more of them, they were smaller. Well, that suggests a food limit. But what hit me was wait a minute, these fish are food limited at 2% of their historic abundance? Something's really gone gunny up here. This stream system is working nothing like it did in 1900. So if you remember, some of you have been around, so you've heard the story, I'm not going to repeat it. But basically over a period of years, we put together the food story and how stuff works. But the bottom line is, and I think it's still the tr true, still true, that it's the movement of water, sediment, and organic matter from the ridge tops down the hillsides into tributary streams and it goes out the bottom and that takes care of everything. <coughs> that's your food, that's your habitat, that takes care of temperature, it takes care of it all. The biggest mistake we've made in restoration is reducing into, into component models. So the thing that scares me to death, in fact I've given this talk so many times but I'll say it again, I am absolutely shocked at this point that a good engineer never came up with a solar water cooler. Because <laughs> that would take care of the temperature problem. And so if we take care of the temperature problem with solar coolers, we take care of all these modules with a technological fix, my argument is, we still have nothing. So anyway, that's the takeoff in 1992 of the Knowles Project. I think that story is still true. The other part of the argument that I'll just mention is, and what we said was, it took us a century to get here. Why do we think it's going to take us less than a century to get out? Let's be real about this. We're talking about the movement of sediment, water, and organic matter through this basin. That's what counts. So I wouldn't expect that we're going to see much change. But I've been surprised. Um, there has been a lot of change. Uh, and I'll talk about this. Uh, a little bit. But first, to put this in context, let's go back to 1900 when the Sayuslaw produced these huge number of coho. And many people argue that coho, the Sayuslaw was the largest producer of coho in the continental U.S. for size. No basin approached it. So if there's a coho basin in the Pacific Northwest, this is it. Well, how many smolts, just go back to the envelope and, you know, we know rough average survival in the ocean. How many smolts would Knowles Creek have to produce if the Sayusla Basin all produced coho equally? How many coho would the Sayus would Knowles Creek have to produce? The answer is 50,000. Well, we've seen 15. So, that, just to put that in a little piece of context to think about. Okay, now let's go to the Knowles Creek Juvenile Counts. Prior to 1980, fishery biologists really had no way to get a snapshot of the abundance and distribution of fish in a basin. You could electrofish, but you can electrofish about two pools a day with a crew of five to seven. And you can snorkel and count 100 to 150 a day. The bottom line is, using electrofishing techniques, no one ever did a population estimate of a creek the size of Knowles. No one ever knew where the fish were distributed before 1985. And Knowles Creek was one of the two or three basins where the method was developed to do this snapshot. So what do we see here? 
what we see is cohort juveniles have, have been as low as 2,000, and they've been as high as over 70,000. So that's the range that we're dealing with here in the last 17 years. A couple comments about this year. That's the only year that I'm convinced the number of juveniles was caused by the number of returning adults. Why do I think that's true? In 1992, we had the drought of record for anybody that was around. The flow of Gold Creek at the bottom at the mouth at the trap site was one quart a minute for six weeks. That's pretty tough on coho in the basin. <laughs> Our smolt estimate going out was 200 to 400 fish, smolts. Survival is 4% in the ocean. We're talking like a dozen fish coming back. Half of them roughly got to be males, half females, so now we're down to five pairs. They come back in anywhere from October to January into March. Uh, and those fish have to not only come in at the same time, but they got to find each other in 45 miles of stream. That's pretty tough. That's a pretty tough road to hoe. But one of the stories here is, out of that year class, we got 2,000 juveniles. When they came back three years later, one, two, three, they were up to about 6,000. One, two, three, they were over 30 in two generations. There's one of the lessons. Coho respond really rapidly to good situations, good characteristics, good, good year class habitat in all the points of their habitat. Yeah? If you had 12 fish, there was a bomb population, are you concerned about genetic effects at this point? Yeah, that's an argument that's made all the time right, in all kinds of arenas. And my experience in looking at Coho is, this is how they've operated up and down the coast from day one. I mean, even back when they were doing the models, I mean, it's, it's really hard. You really have to work hard to drive Coho to extinction and keep them out. Because <laughs> darn it, they keep showing up. A pair, two pairs. And it doesn't take them long and they can build. They're what ecologists call an R species, meaning they have high fecundity, meaning they lay a lot of eggs per, per adult. So for example, one coho female lays about 2,000 eggs. Well shoot, we had 2,000 juveniles in 95. That's, and, and survival can be very high out of these initially, up to 80 or 90% in good habitat. So you can easily get 2,000 juveniles out of one red. So we're only looking at a couple reds, probably. Um, so what do we make of this? Well, one, I mean, we do have a real shopping pattern. But we sort of saw that it, it did go up. Lots of things happened. Ocean, uh, ocean harvest was limited here in the mid-90s. Um, Conditions got a little better. They were dismal in the middle 90s. But anyway, they peaked, and then it looks like the juvenile counts have headed down since about 2002 or 3. Okay, well, those are numbers. And the reason for that could be anywhere. That's the other thing I think that we've learned in looking at this 17 years. The worst thing I think we can do is go out and say, what's the bottleneck here and let's fix it. So we'll argue about, is it summer habitat, is it winter habitat? Well, I can tell you in 1992 it was the summer limit because the stream didn't have any water in it. And so if you got 400 fish going to the ocean, you aren't going to have much of a return for adults. It doesn't much, nothing else much matters. So clearly in some years, it's low flow. Was low flow what limited them this year? Not on your life. I mean, the flows out there right now are, you know, equal to what we've seen in May in some years. So it's like everything else that we all have experience with, or your garden or anything else. Every year is different, and it can be something different that screws up your garden or whatever else. Fish are the same way.
It's the same story. We all know this story. So anyway, it looks like they go up and down. Okay, I think juvenile numbers are a good thing, certainly, to track, because if the long-term trend is down, uh, that doesn't bode well. But here it's a mixed bag. Something's going on, but the total numbers aren't what's going to help us figure that out. Uh-uh, okay. Ha! But one of the things that's real interesting to look at is let's look at the survival of those fish. So, see, this is where now this life history monitoring on Knowles gets interesting. Because we just talked about the trap. That's when the fish are a year and a half headed out to the ocean. But the snorkel count we just saw was a juvenile the previous summer. So we can look at their survival from juvenile to small and begin to ask, well, does it make any sense? Can we see any patterns? Is it summer or is it winter or something else? But it seems to me over time that survival is a pretty good measure to watch. Because if you've got a lot of fish, you're going to reach a point where the survival is going to decline. You would suspect. Well, let's look at a few of these. And the year, okay, it's the year they were juveniles on the bottom. So, the lowest year we had was 95. And that's one of the highest survival rates we had. Well, that makes sense. And notice that from our snorkel, snorkel count, and, it, and I did, uh, just for those of you who know this, I'll say it, the rest of you, it doesn't matter. But, but this is actually a calibrated count. It's not just my estimate. It's calibrated based on how many fish would actually be there. To make a long story short, I only see about three quarters of the fish. And so over the years, people have gone in and electrofished after I've done estimates. And year in, year out, it's been roughly two-thirds to three-quarters. So I bump these numbers of juveniles up. So these are actual calculated survivors. These aren't just the, from the estimates. So we're seeing in some years, 30 and 40 percent survival. I mean, that's decent. Let's look at... Uh, so 95 was a low year. Let's look at the highest year. The highest year is 2003. 2003 has one of the lowest survival rates. Okay, that's not a surprise. So some of this is beginning to make a little bit of sense. Uh, 2004 was just a little bit less than 2003. And then you'll notice actually that the survival rates in the last few years have been relatively good. So it's not survival in the streams in the last couple of years that's really been the issue. And in fact, when we had the really high years, um, the survival has been low. But there's so many juveniles, I mean 60,000, that it sort of swamps it out, so you still get a, a high number of return. But it is very interesting to look at survivors. So, because this is telling you a lot about the carrying capacity and how well the fish do. Okay. So, now I want to shift gears and talk just a little bit about the RBA data and some new ways of looking at that that I've been doing lately. So, I don't think anybody's heard this. Um, now, the RBA we snorkeled for three years, 2005, 6, and 7. We got funding from EPA. Uh, those were the primary funding sources. All I'd like you to do right now is, here's what we have on this graph. Now, and now it's complicated, but I'm going to give you the simple explanation of it. This is just basin size. And here is basically um, the relative number of coho per hectare. So this is a rate. I didn't want to do total fish. I want to see if the rate is increasing in parts of a basin or if it's decreasing. This is like acceleration. Instead of doing your speed, I want to look at whether we're accelerating and how fast because what I want to pull out are where are the key areas that fish are being produced in the basin. The key areas where fish are being produced in the basin, you're going to see a high jump in this relative number. 
Now, how do we think about this? Okay, so Knowles is blue here, and this is 2005. Here's the old growth, so we're way up in these little tiny basins. Obviously, it takes a certain size basin before you're going to have any fish because you don't have a permanent stream. So you know you're going to start basically at zero somewhere here. So here's the old growth. Here's upper nodes. Here's middle nodes. This is where the rate peaks. And then it starts uh, middle nodes, lower nodes. And so we're out here at 50 hectares or 20 square miles. So what this is giving you is it's, is it's telling you we're making all the basins the same size that we snorkel. So this is 35 tributaries in the study slot. And I split them up from Forest Service to Checkerboard, but I'm not going to talk about that tonight. I just want to talk about Knowles and the RBA. So what is this suggesting? Well, what in Knowles, the peak is somewhere around here, 15 hectares. This is the crucial basin area for producing coho. And Knowles is basically higher than any of the others in the entire basin by quite a lot. So that's 2005. So I did the same thing in 2006. Whoops, that went the wrong way. Sure not. Okay, 2006. Same, same thing now. So here's Knowles. But we see a few other streams now just blipped up higher. But Knowles is still pretty high in this, this other large stream here. This is Esmond, for those of you who know the basin very well. Those are the only two basins we can dot with all of it. So we have a count of all the tributaries, largely because of, of denial of private land. So this is 2006. And here's 2007. Oh, I forgot. Okay, so here's Knowles in 2007. And again, you see the same pattern. Now go back and think about 2005, 6, and 7 data that we saw from either the small count or uh, the juvenile count. And they were average counts in Knowles. Those, those weren't high counts in 2005, 6, or 7. Those are average counts. But look at what's going on here. Is Basically, upper knolls, the top of middle knolls, is really producing more fish than anything else in the entire Sayuslaw Basin. Uh, I think that's real. I can't tell you all the reasons why, uh, but I think we know a few of them. So, what does this tell us? How does the RBA data help us here? Well, it's a snapshot to basically take our experience on Knowles Creek and then begin to look at where the fish are distributed, the abundance and distribution of them. In healthy streams, two things are going to happen. One, you'll have high relative coho per area, and you're also going to see a peak that's further down. Those of you who are here to my at some of the talks I gave before, in years when there's small coho numbers, they're all in upper knolls or the old growth. In years when there's a lot of them, that's still a core area, but the real big production is downstream. So you move the center of their distribution downstream. That's the key to producing big year classes. So for me, having this information ought to really help you prioritize restoration. Because what you're really concerned about is where are these places where there's really high production of coal per unit area? What are the risks to those fish, those areas? Because some of these areas are producing, here's 200 and this is 50, <coughs> producing more than four times these basins down here. And I think the RBA gives us a picture and tools to help us focus in on where in this landscape we're really producing fish and where aren't we. And I think that gives us also a really important tool for looking at how well we've been doing as far as the restoration. So I'll stop with that. Questions and answers? Yeah. Charlie, are the, are the other dot, the high, the high dots, the red ones, are those on like the three years that you're showing there, are they the same streams too? I mean, are, are they, they the same streams? Yeah. Uh, the, the majority of them are, yes. Okay. Say at least three quarters of them are the same streams. So they've got good production in the yes. same 
breaches, basically. Yes. So there are some yeah, so that story, that pattern is repeated in, in all the streams. Mm -hmm. So even the low streams have the same, even the low streams. I mean, there's some streams, I, I, I won't name them, uh, but there's some streams in this basin and if somebody can explain to me how they survive year in, year out, because I've been doing counts in some of these streams 20 years. But there's two streams in particular that I'll dive and go for eight miles and never count more than one coho in a pool. Now, how can that be? But they're still there. And there's one fish a pool for basically eight miles. <laughs> Uh, I don't have a clue. Yeah. I got two questions. What's RBA stand for? Oh, rapid bioassessment. And what that means, good question, sorry. I, I mean, yeah, I should never. Is it B or B? It's B. So it's rapid bioassessment. Oh, and what it is, is we took a standard <clears throat> snorkel count like we do in Knowles. In Knowles, I start at the bottom. And I divide the stream up into riffles, pools, and glides. And every fifth pool I count, and every eighth glide I count. And glide's anything I can't decide if it's a riffle or a pool. If I have a hard time telling that it's a glide. So that's the trash can. And then pools. And the reason you want to do this is coho are primarily pool fish, so why should you count all these riffles and get zeros? Let's put our effort where the fish are. So, so that's how you do a standard, what's called standard Hank and Reeves. They're the two guys that developed the method. What an RBA method does is we're only going to count one out of five pools. So every fifth pool I come to, you count. So it's not counting glides or riffles. Now, that gives you a good estimate of coho because the majority of them are in the pools. And so an RBA is, is a faster snapshot, so I can cover way more ground. And yeah. so Seth, you want to add anything? Seth dove a lot of them. Seth <laughs> dove. There were there were two crews most of those years. Seth was one of them. Gus. Those are the two local guys. What what uh, reasons would you give for more nutrients coming off the reef stops? And hundred years ago, let's say, compared to now. <laughs> I don't think there's more, well, uh, okay. It is a food story, but one, uh, okay, let me give you some pieces of it, because it's taken me a long time to figure this out. But because I think this is the problem, and I don't think anybody's really been addressing it. Why? I mean, this isn't easy for empirical scientists to deal with counting numbers. How are you going to count these kind of numbers? It's hard to measure the things that really matter here. But some observations. Um, one, let's look at the riparian zones. Uh, our, from a food perspective, our riparian zones now are dominated by second growth alder. Right? We took our mixed conifer hardwood away, and it, most of them are second growth alder, you know what I'm talking about? Is that a good thing or a bad thing from a food store? Fast asleep in the world, that's right. Nitrogen is the limiting element here. Alder's producing nitrogen. Hey, we ought to have more food than we had a hundred years ago. And that's true. However, all there is the fastest leaf in the world, when the juvenile coal come out of the gravel in February, what are the midges feeding on? What's the coarse particulate they're feeding on? Anybody who's been out of our fish trap when, the, when it rains, you see what leaf litter is in. It's maple. I'm not surprised that the fish are located around Mapleton. <laughs> I don't think that's a coincidence. And nobody, and I've been telling this story for 20 years, and nobody yet, I have yet to hear a riparian specialist talk about maple. And there's one more just to tag in. 
one of Ray's hobby horses, and he's exactly right here. And I was just reminded of this a few weeks ago by a uh, retired dean of the forestry school at Yale. The other problem with alder is it acidifies your stream, making the nutrients less available and making the macroinvertebrates a less it's a less hospitable environment for macroinvertebrates. The other thing maple does is it has deep roots and pulls calcium out of the bedrock and out of the lower soil levels. Calcium is critical. So what I would argue is maple is a big part of this. Go walk an old growth stream. Go walk the headwaters of Knowles. I think I've walked every old growth now in 25 miles of here. What's the dominant part of it in every one of those? Maple. There's alder, but maple dominates is the harbor. So that's part of the story. The other part of the story is most of this organic matter moves during storms, and most of it moves in debris flows. We've always had debris flows in this landscape. Anybody who thinks we haven't, I don't know what they're smoking. But we have always had debris flows in this landscape, overall or not. But what's different is this, how they function, how they move. And we saw this in the wolves in 96. So it, it proved our hypothesis here. My picture is all this material comes down and forms a temporary dam, sets up for about 20 years. When it forms this temporary dam, it stores the organic matter in sediment. And it becomes highly productive. You often get willows growing, you get beavers in those, and they become a hot spot. Lasts for about 20 years, and then it cuts around the wood, and you start exporting the stuff down <coughs> downstream. But well, you could view knolls as a, as a string of beads like this. Each one of those beads is those flats. And over a period of 20 or 30 years, in, a, in the natural functioning stream, different beads would be setting up and storing material. When I finally figured this story out and walked it in 1987, how many beads were storing material in knolls? One. And it just so happened that 35% uh, of, the, of the juvenile coho in the entire basin were in that torrent pond associated with that flow. That, that told us something. So that was the takeoff here. So what's changed? We still get debris flows, but look at the debris flows we get now. They don't have these big honking pieces of wood that you can't move with a crane or you can't drive down the road. They also, also have big boulders the size of pickup trucks in it. We aren't getting those kind of materials that set up and hold. What we get are short pieces, smaller boulders, short pieces of wood that come down and form a temporary dam for about five minutes or less <laughs> during the storm. It blows out. And I think you've all heard the story of debris of, of splash dams. Well, this is just a splash dam. So my story is, what are we doing to the food? We bring it down, store it for five seconds, and then flush it into the estuary. That's what we do with it. So is that. That's what I think is going on with food story. Sorry for the long-winded answer, but, but I think that's absolutely critical because we're going nowhere, I think, until we fix that story. We're going nowhere. So, here's a question. Um, mm -hmm. I've heard you say some of this before, obviously, like the, the phrase fast is in the West of yours. Mm -hmm. um, maple, I, that's convincing, and I'm buying that too. But what about, um, you've also been quite eloquent about the uh, conifers that also populate the wall of the Lowlands, for example, mm -hmm. the Western Red Cedar. Mm -hmm. We plant a lot of those. Are we over planting those? I mean, uh, what sort of contribution does a cedar, cedar stand make? It might be structural, but is there any nutrition that we're that? Mm -hmm. Well, first is the structural component. And what I would say is, I'm convinced at this point that if I could manage 4% of the, of the watershed in the coast range on the sandstone, if I could manage 4% over a period of time, I could get the function of this food back in 50 to 75 years. But if I don't have four, that 4%, four I don't think you can get it back, period. So are the cedar, I mean, we've been planting cedar, right. big fans of that, is, are we over planting that? No, well, 
here's, here's the critical place. The most critical piece of the landscape in our basins is the riparian zone and the debris torrent fans, if you know what those are. Yeah. Okay, for people that don't, just drive up, well, drive down 126 towards Florence and ask yourself, hmm, why are those houses sitting up higher than all the adjacent houses? And notice that right behind their house, in almost every case, is a draw <laughs> coming down. Because that's the debris torrent fan they built their house on. Why? Because it's higher. Well, it's those fans, because if you've got big overall trees there, when you get one of these debris flows, it does one of two things. One, it stops it. And there was a perfect case of that you can still see at Archie Knowles on the little trips that come in on the opposite side. In 96, there were huge debris flows that came down, and the old growth trees stopped them. So you can stand there and see 15 foot of stuff piled up on these trees that stopped them. And now it's been just working its way up. But the other thing it does, if it is big and it knocks them down, now you've got the pieces you can't bring in with helicopters and you can't bring down the roads. So planning those is absolutely critical. So from that standpoint, the other part is, they're not the best food source, but they always have been a historic part of the food source. And so cedar, well, cedar's main benefit of the system is not food, but a wet cedar log in the stream lasts about 400 years. A wet fir log lasts about 100. A wet maple, you probably see it the next year. But, but so, cedar's real role is not part of the food story, per se. I mean, it's a component of the food story, but it's not critical for food. It's critical for the habitat, and it's critical for how the material moves through the basin. I like, I call it the digestive model. Let's look at how our digestive tract is actually working. We just bring it in and burp it out into the estuary. Paul. Oh. So, getting back to the calcium stuff a little bit, just some additional things to think about. I think when, say in the early 1900s, late 1800s, when all the fish were coming back, eating all the nutrients out of the ocean, the calcium story from your maple wasn't wasn't even something to think about. I think, I think because you know now that we're not getting these returns back, the nutrients from the fish aren't adding to that. I think until you get those nutrients coming back as well, you're not going to solve the nutrient issue in the stream. That you're not going to even rival getting back what we used to have. Yeah, I get yeah. up. And, sure. and that leads into some of the okay. discussions about harvesting coho during these times that we have all these excess coho coming back and, mm -hmm. and that we should be harvesting them and, and where we shouldn't be letting them go back to the stream. And, uh, uh, yeah, this add those nutrients. Sure. Uh, yeah, that's, that's an important point. Um, yes, that marine derived nutrients were historically important, and yes, it is the case that we won't see the high production. But, and, and so, yes, it makes the, the calcium in the trees more important now than it would be in a, in a natural stream. I'll grant you that. But, but the other part of this story is that I, I, I'm, I'm not as willing to limit fishing to the point we limited it here for this reason. Um, one is, um, the fish and the food start their life cycle at the same time. So the leaf litter and the salmon carcasses are basically start in the stream the same time the eggs go in the gravel. So the food story and the eggs start basically at the same time in the fall. That's the start of the year for stream systems. So we're going through. If you, if you have the numbers we have now, well, yeah, if you have the numbers you have now, uh, there's two things that, that I want to point out. Is one, it compensatorily builds itself, meaning when you start getting big runs back with a stream system that can hold the material in. And so it, it's interesting, the two guys that sort of put the nutrient story together, um, they're two fairly famous fish bios. 
And my first question to him drinking a beer was, how long did you look at that stream for that stream that would retain all those carcasses in that system? And they snickered and said, yeah, longer than you'd want to think about it. Because if you just went out and poured carcasses in, you're not going to get the response. So one is, what I would want to say is, is it's going to naturally build back together. I mean, large returning runs are going to provide the nutrients for large rearing classes after that. So what we, we've seen right now that it's not nutrients exactly that are limiting. On the biggest year class we had come back, it's had the lowest survival. So nutrients aren't explaining at all here. Um, so, but, but yes, I think you build it back. Uh, oh shoot, what was the other part I wanted to say? Oh, yeah, several years ago when it was proposed that we ought to be putting salmon carcasses in the stream, my response was, if you put salmon carcasses in Knowles Creek, you're going to lose everything. And this is why. Is on all these sandstone streams, they have no low flows in late summer. And so if you start upping the nutrient content through a year, you're increasing the biological oxygen demand in that stream system. So I've snorkeled pools and knolls where I've started at the bottom, you can sort of barely see. And I do this with my hands over the bottom and release the methane, and I watch the fish die right in front of my face mask. That's how close they are. You put a salmon carcass or you up the nutrients in any of those ponds, you've lost everything. But don't you put them in when they normally come in, like in November? Yeah, but, but the point is, is, yeah, is it, 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 yeah. I mean, they're not the only thing, see, the only thing that, that makes it not a problem in most places is they aren't retained anyway. Most of them are just okay. burped out the estuary and they don't do much. But if you put them in knolls where we built structures that would retain stuff, if you did it in knolls, I'd argue you could very easily lose everything we got. Simply because you're not paying attention to how these streams work and what they got the capacity to do and not do in the state they're in. Knolls could not take any more nutrients. So that's the only thing that makes me a little apprehensive about, uh, well, about given the situation we have with the habitat, um, you know, arguing that we need to up those nutrients now in order to bring the juveniles up. I'm, I'm less convinced that's true on sandstone. It might be true on the salt streams, but I don't think sandstone. So okay. Charlie, we have time for one more question. Since there's only one person signed up for open mic, I suggest we take, um, roll over a little bit. Do you have time for one more question? So I saw both what, I think Wesley and um, Pat first. So. You had made a comment about um, changes in the in Knowles in 2010 when you snorkeled it this year, mm -hmm. it didn't seem like there was any big events that would have changed it. But can you um, say what, yeah. what made the pools change? Well, I think most of us live in the coast range, but I'll just tell you my experience the last couple of years. Um, the biggest storm event we've had in the North Fork wasn't even in 96. Uh, my brother-in-law has lived in the same house that he has for 40 years. The highest the water's been in 40 years was on Thanksgiving, like two years ago or three years ago. The water was up on the road over his driveway, never been that even in 96. Um, the point I want to make is I'm becoming more and more convinced the longer I live here that in the coast range it's driven by small cells of high intensity. And we ain't mapping those very carefully. <laughs> but in looking at stream systems, it's really clear to me that there is a really wide variety. And like I say, where I live, you can see the clouds come up and bump against, and, and it takes them forever to go over. And when they're trying to go over, it's just dumping on, on you. And so I'm really convinced that we don't really have a very good handle on rainfall that counts in the coast range. And until we get a network of rainfall gauges out here to prove that, you know, I, well, I'm convinced that if we do, we're going to find out that, you know, these
models are not very good at predicting rainfall in the coast range. So that's my first comment. So I, I'm convinced there was a big event on Knowles. Now, it, it wasn't as high as 96, doesn't take that, because it isn't just the peak flow. There's other variables here that are setting it up that create changes. So but it was a high, it was a very high event. The things had been set up so that when we got it, we got the biggest channel changes. Just like the February 96 storm, other than the big debris flows that hit the main stem of Knowles, didn't do very much in Knowles. But November 96, the place came unglued. And so it isn't just peak flows that are driving this. It's a pretty dynamic sort of system of its own. So although I, I think there was plenty big enough storm to do it, and so I'm convinced there was a cell that sat up Knowles and did that. So. Right. Any sense of lamprey spawner numbers and trends in Knowles? Well, the water, yeah. Well, I, I can just tell you back to the, I can just tell you back into the eighties. I mean, in the spring, I'd maybe see fifty or a hundred, where now I see half a dozen. I'm just wondering if you gained that back again at the nutrient at that time of year, would that kick your, your problem? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. You know what, but I guess what they're seeing with the lander is that they're using those lower portions yeah. of those basins anyway, so yeah. Yeah. probably wouldn't. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.